Hey there, welcome to Sin Seeker. My name is Luke. It is music making diary number five. Uh, so what have I been working on? Well, um, we're transitioning into sort of a long process for me. Um, it takes me a long time to write music. Uh, and really that's, I, I guess that varies from person to person. Um, but uh, we're entering the place that I actually uh, enjoy doing the most. Um, I've made a few changes to the set. I'm going to share those with you. I'm going to talk about what I'm doing now. Um, if you don't know what this is, what this is, as far as what's going on, you have to go back and watch diaries one through four, uh, or at least start with one and then jump back to this one. That'll explain what the point of this video playlist is. Uh, I don't want to do a full recap and stuff, but I'm working on a piece of music. Um, and just, I'm not showing you the how the sausage is made uh, as far as like, I'm not just streaming me making tracks. Um, I do the work and then I do a little demo here and show you what's changed and why. Okay. If that's useful for you and your music making endeavors, great. Uh, or if you just like to be a voyeur and see what's going on or be feel like a part of the community, that's cool too. All right. So let's jump in and see what's going on. Uh, so what's changed? Um, I have inverted the color scheme in the set. I know it's very minor. People are always fixated on how does it look and feel, UI, etc. cetera. Uh, every instrument is its own color now. It was by sections because when I was working on the sections and composing them, uh, it was easier when each section was color coded so that I could understand what I was doing when I was shifting things around. But now that I've got the shape of the song sort of where I want it to be, um, I pivot that and I give every instrument its own color so that I can when I'm comparing, I'm like looking at clips. Uh, let's say I've got these two clips. Uh, so I'm looking at these three clips here. Um, I want to be able to see which instruments are playing where, right? The horn part's yellow, the bass part's sort of this bluish, and the uh, EPM stuff is green here. That's this, doing the instruments by color facilitates that in Ableton for me. Okay. Um, now, uh, the other thing that's going on is I put in, now I still need to understand where those sections begin and end, right? And it's hard when they're all one color, uh, you know, where are the different sections? So what I do is I put in locators. So up in the timeline up here, there are these little A, B, C, D, E, F, G. These are locators. You just uh, right click up there and say add locator and it allows you to give it a name. You can call it whatever you want. I just use letters because it's simpler. And when I zoom out, like when I'm, when I'm in, you could see the full name, but when I really compress it down, uh, if they have long names, they get, they overlap and you can't read them. So I just go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay. Now who cares about locators? Well, it's easy to be able to see where everything is because of the locators, right? Um, you know, you could do like verse, pre-chorus, chorus, those could be your locators, but I do A, B, C because I'm sort of telling a story. And I, you know, section A is one thing, section B is another thing. And I'll get to why that's valuable for me. The other thing you can do with locators is these are clickable triggers. And so the same way you would launch clips in, you know, session view, in arrangement view, you can launch locators. So if I'm playing, let's say I start playing here, right? I can click on a locator and jump to it and it'll do it with um, the quantization of the launching, right? It follows loop launch quantization. Okay, so locators will launch quantized against the downbeat, which is great because um, that allows you to that allows you to. Um, sort of audition different parts, right? So if I've got a verse, I can insert next to it a variation on that verse, and then I can hit the locator leading up to that and then play it through once with the first verse or play it from the leading section and then jump to the locator with the new version. I can AB them, I can compare them, right? Without having to create new tracks necessarily. Now, granted, creating tracks is trivial and you can do that as well, but um, I like the locator methodology. It works good for me. Okay. Now the other thing I've been doing in the last few days, besides changing color and adding organizational locators to the system is I've been working on the theme, the song, the story of the song, right? I make story music, right? I want 
when someone's listening to this to have like this implied story in their mind's eye, right? And some of the pieces I do um, have some dialogue over the like, last piece I did or second to last piece most recently. Um, what is it? Um, the Cassiopeia X1 song. Um, it's out on Bandcamp. You can go listen to it. It's uh, a piece of story music that has dialogue over it. I hired voice actors uh, and gave them a script and basically said, I need these little audio snippets of people talking. And it was, it was members of the crew of a ship, of a spaceship talking to each other, right? Took those, brought them in. And on Bandcamp, there's two versions of the song. There's one with the dialogue and one without it, purely instrumental. I, I like that. Uh, and I'm going to probably do that again, probably somewhere on this album, if not the whole album, certainly for segments of it. So when I want to write a piece of music, I start out with a sort of story in mind, or I start noodling and you know, mining like from the previous videos. But eventually I get to a point where I need to actually write down <laughs> some words that imply my feelings, uh, emotions, you know, what kind of tropes or emotional you know, curves are happening in this music. Uh, and to that end, what I've done and I will continue to do is I listen to the current mix down of the music and I take notes on each locator of what's happening there. All right. And that's what I have here. This is just a simple text file with a bunch of notes for each locator that says what I was thinking at this point. Now I'm going to, I'm going to insert here a little quick 30 second video that is the time lapse of me doing the first pass of this because I do this repeatedly a lot. Um, like what's here in the notes is not what you'll see in this, um, in this little clip. Um, but basically I just listen to the song and I'll jump back in locators and I'll sort of loop things as I'm you know, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and I write down the themes for each section or the story beats for each section. And those are influenced by the music but also ideas I have in the notes make me change the music. So the notes that you'll see are notes of like, what are the characters? What are they doing? But there's also, what is the music doing and what could it do in the future? And this is how I sort of brainstorm and sort of cycle on developing the piece. And so this is going to happen probably for another week or two going to sort of look at each section, start fleshing out its instrumentation. That's what I've done over the last couple of days, and I'll share that with you in a minute. Um, but as I'm building this instrumentation out, I'm referencing the notes to impact what's going into the music. And then what happy accidents or discoveries I make while I'm playing with the music and developing it, I'll go and I'll update the notes and say, okay, the story's changing. It's going to be more like this. Um, and it's sort of these two paths travel along and eventually at the end of the piece, when it's finished, they meet. And I will either have a completed story with some notes of dialogue around it that may or may not get inserted into the song, or at the very least, they're can included in the liner notes for the piece. So if you go look at the um, EP I put out last year, there's three tracks on it. If, you, uh, if you're on Bandcamp and you drill into those tracks, there are segments of, uh, of the story for each piece in there. Um, and you can go read those if you want to sort of inspire your musical daydreams as you're listening to this, but that's how I work. It's what makes me happy. Okay. So to that end, let me show you this clip and then I'll be right back. Take a look. Okay, so that was the first pass. I listened to the song and I typed all that in there, right? Uh, and, and that's what's going on. So that aside, we've got locators, we've got our color stuff going on. What am I doing with the music? Well, in the last few days, I've been working on section C here, okay? And section C is the introduction of the two sort of characters of the piece. And they each have their own voice. One character has this chroma, chroma polaris sort of horn voice, which may or may not change, but that's what it is right now. And then there's an e-piano with a sort of funky, distorted, phased echo going on on that. And they play, and the bass plays, and there's a little temp track of rhythm. Um, and I need to flesh that out a little bit. And so I've been fiddling around with uh, this bell pad. Right. 
If you've ever used a Roland D50, there's a classic patch on it called um, Fantasia, I think, which is like a Fantasia bell. This is a pad based on the Fantasia sort of bell patch, right? It's, it's clean, a little chorus, very high shimmering sort of um, bell sound. And it's making for a good pad over top of the horns in the piano, right? So I've got, if we look at the registers, right, I've got, uh, I've got the bass in blue here is in this low register. And then I've got these horns in yellow and the e-piano in this teal sort of turquoisey green. These are living together in this range. And I wanted something on top of it sort of floating and sustaining. Like they're doing, it's real busy down here, <laughs> right? Uh, so I need something that's going to just sort of float above it all and tie it together. And that's what these pads are going to do. So maybe we'll play this segment. Whoops play the segment without losing sight of all the stuff. And there's just the pad, right? It's over top of it. Right? It's not busy. It's not doing anything. It's just floating. And it's not even playing chords. Like I'm, like I said, I'm not a music theory guy. I tend to do implied chords using intervals, right? So that is how a piece develops uh, for me. I work on a section and that section, uh, I have a story for what's happening in that section. And then I start using that story to influence the instrumentation and what's happening there. I try and spread things out across um, the sort of octaves that are available uh, to give something a job in each of those areas. And they don't have to be there. Sometimes you want it to be really sparse. Um, but that's how that works. And this will iterate. So I'm going to call that section done for today and move on to another section. Okay. That's something else that I really, you know, used to struggle with that I, I don't struggle anymore is the, the dreaded eight bar loop problem, right? Um, I do not finish any section, um, until almost at the end of the, of the song production itself. I, uh, like I said, I, I loop over everything. I loop over my loops. I iterate. I go from beginning to end, work on a section, work on a section, work on a section, work on a section. But it's a half-ass job on each of those I do. Is this incrementally better than it was when I sat down? Yes. Great. Move on to the next one. Is this one, what do we want to do here? Does it tie into this one before it? Does it tie into the one that's coming? I, I care about those transition points. Um, it's really easy to get trapped in the... I'm going to hyper produce this eight bar loop. I'm going to get 50 instruments on. I'm going to EQ it and compress it and put my effects on it and get it perfect and make it awesome. And then you, it doesn't fit anymore. It's like, what do I do before? And what do I do after? Some people can manage that, but I do not. If I, if I go down the eight bar loop rabbit hole and, and hyper produce that, that song is probably dead because I, or I'm just going to use that loop for the entire fricking song and not actually go anywhere with it, which is a perfectly valid kind of music, but it's not what I'm trying to make here. I'm trying to make, um, I'm trying to make a landscape, right. That, that does something that undulates curves and things like that. We got some plains, some rivers, some mountains, some interesting thing. Um, so I, to that end, um, I do everything half-assed. I'm, today I'm going to work on a couple sections and I'm going to improve them a little bit uh, and then walk away, come back tomorrow, listen to them again. Do those sound good? Yes. Okay, well, let's work on the sections before and after them. Let's sort of put them all together. Um, and that's how I develop this stuff. Okay. So that section's now got a new high pad floating over it. Now, I take that. I like these intervals, right? And this section, section C, happens again later over here section f if i go to my notes so section c is the character sort of the twins theme there's two guys right well this gets uh, well, i get a restatement of that in f so section f is a restatement of the twins theme but instead of them one playing in the next one they play layered okay so let's jump to f here 
So our F section, right? There we go. Our F section. All right, so our F section is a restatement of that theme. That's the theme for the twins. Um, and that's basically happening. Uh, all right, so they're layered on top of each other. It's the two clips from earlier that I started with just copying those over, bam, and laying on top of each other. And they were identical copies. But I try not to have that exact duplication. So I go through and I'm changing things. So layering them on top of each other um, we have where one will play something energetic and then hold and then play something energetic, you know, and then play something energetic and hold and then a little bit and then hold again. And during those holds, I have the other instrument, the other voice, if we're talking about the twins, right? The twins, um, while one is holding this note, the other one is doing something singing, right? So while the horn holds here, the E piano does a run and then the E piano holds and the horn does a run and then a small hold. And they can come together and do counterpoint where they play against each other or, or you know, layered melodies that's happening here. But that's what this segment is. It's the first two themes that were established playing again, right? Because repetition legitimizes. You want to have callbacks or I want to have callbacks like composition's very personal. Um, I want to have people be able to hum that theme, right? Say, oh yeah, I remember that. That's the theme for the twins or whatever that is. Who knows <laughs> where the story will go, but I've got these two instruments playing together. Um, and again, I wanted to put a high, just like in the first section C, I've got that high, you know, Fantasia style bell pad playing high intervals over that. I wanted that again, but I needed to change it up a bit. So I changed it with this, a different instrument. So here I'm using, um, whereas before it was this bell pad, right? In the restatement section, we're using a different, where am I going here? There we go. Right, it's still a pad, but it's introducing a little more rhythm but it's muted, right? It's easy for my stuff to get too busy, but it's not, it's not arpeggiating, right? Cause then it would definitely be too busy, but it's comping, it's, it's stabbing. And I took the, this was my bell interval chords. And here is the stabby interval chords. It's the same chord intervals, um, but they're split now and they play a high octave and a low octave and a high octave and a low octave. And you get this sort of sound. All right. And when we lay that over top of our twins playing their thing, we get, so you could see in the sort of registry there, um, they're, they're not overlapping too much, right? Everything's sort of got a little space to play with. All right, so, so again, I'm taking this section and I'm iterating on it. I'm adding a little bit, um, looking at my notes, coming back in, changing the music. If the music, if I have a happy accident or something like that, or I come up with a new idea that I really like, I may have to go insert a new section into the story, right? Give it its own locator, do something like that. And I have no problem with killing the babies, right? Uh, if, you know, if in my exploration of playing with new instruments, I say, you know what, those, those original lines, melody lines or chord progressions that I had here, they're, they're aging out. They're like, I, I, they don't work now. I've got a new idea that works better. Pew, throw them away. That's fine. Uh, so there's two sections I've been working on. Okay. Um, another section is here. I started playing with a little rhythm. Okay. 
I think I, I mentioned in the, uh, in diary number four, the rhythm part is really just a placeholder, right? All the rhythm everywhere is that, this loop. It's, it's a four bar loop. It's doing nothing except that it gives me a beat, um, with a kick and something to provide something to syncopate against. All right. I'm using that throughout the entire piece with the idea is that I'm going to go back and replace it. And so as I'm building these sections out, what I do is I go and I will either tweak that when I have something I want to happen rhythmically, or I'll drop a loop on top of it to imply and give me sort of motivation to move in a particular compositional direction. So like this segment here has this loop on top of it. I've got uh, Right, and that's happening on top of our. All right, so I will use loops to use them as placeholders for thematic purposes, right? It's like, I know I want to have something that's got a huge Tom roll, right? Um, my, my dad, um, uh, my dad's a drummer. I've heard a reference to the drum, the, that giant sort of like dad rock drum Tom roll as being called Quaalude Thunder. <laughs> so there's a reference for you. Um, but uh, so I use these as placeholders. Now, all of these loops that I'm using here came out of uh, Spectrosonic Stylus, which is just a drum loop tool. Uh, it's a very good one. It's been around for a long time, has a massive library with a lot of different styles. And I just, it's just my go-to for, I got to pull loops out. Uh, and I just drop them in as placeholders. Now, um, I talked about these two loops in Diary 4. This is another section here that is getting a little loop love, all right, in that I want to pull out the hats here because what's happening is this is, uh, there's a transition going on here. Let me mute the uh, drums. And what's happening is... There's this sort of falling down. There's um, an emotional sort of, we're coming down here, right? If we were at a high in the section before it, we're gonna come back down and reset to a new normal that is the next section, right? So it's sort of this transitional thing. But I know I want this to be pretty bombastic. I want a march sort of feel, like field snares and big bass drums, boom, bap, but boom, 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 bap, right? Something like that, like a march. Um, and so I went digging around his stylus and I found this. Uh, I found this. Right, that's perfect as far as it has a lot of emotional content. It's got an impact there. And I'm just gonna drop it in here as a reminder to myself that I wanna do something like this here. I may use this in the final production or I may build something. Um, my pride wants me to go build things, um, but my need to complete a project uh, within a reasonable schedule may make me use this loop and then maybe add a few things on top of it but we'll see we'll find out and as a memo to all of us when this is finally done um, we'll look at section g measure 57 and say is that loop still in there and then you'll know whether i which way i went but uh, if we pull this out and we zoom in on it um, what i do here generally because using loops can get really abrupt right sudden changes um, I will usually have a tail, um, a tail at the end, like for the final hit, and I'll have a lead in a little bit. So the loop doesn't actually start right on the section. I've got a little sort of coming in. I don't fade it in or anything like that. I keep the level down enough. So it's, um, it, it just kind of works. And it's, this is a half-assed job here as far as a transition, and that will force me to go and, uh, and address it at some future iteration, right, to, to actually do the right thing here. So I actually leave things, like I said earlier, I don't wanna fixate on that eight bar loop stuff. I don't wanna overproduce one little segment, but I produce it enough so that I'm inspired to keep rolling, but it's still crappy enough that I will go back and polish it again at the end. 
all right, or at some point. Uh, and so what we have here when we listen to this uh, is it sounds like I'll do the lead up. There's our hats, and they're going to drop out, and our new part. And so that tail has got one final like boom, hit at the end, which goes into the bass drops out here in this new segment, this new section H. Um, and that's a clean transition for me, right? That, that low end, we've got the bass playing, we've got these deep bass drums thumping, thumping, thumping. And then when we hit section H, we have one less hit of the bass drum and the bass guitar drops out. So it's kind of a drop. Um, EDM drops are a different critter. <laughs> That's not what I mean. But from my perspective, it's an emotional drop. We've, mm, we've come way down. And that was the point of that section was to bring us down. All right. So, um, that's about it. All right. So here's diary number five. Um, we talked about the mechanics of color coding. Uh, I covered locators. Locators are super useful, both as a mechanical tool for jumping around and doing arrangement, but also, uh, we talked about I use them to help me delineate sections of my story and be able to jump around and focus on what's going on, help drive the creation of a story that the music is based on, and then that story goes back and impacts the music over time. I don't hyperproduce eight bar loops. I iterate and do crappy jobs, but I cover the whole song. The whole song makes progress, not just that one little four bar loop. Um, and then I do it over and over and over until I polish it up and develop it up to a point where I'm happy enough to say, let it out of the cage, right? Because nothing's ever done. I could, I could continue to do that process forever and never release the music. So at some point I have to let it go. Uh, and then between sessions, I let it go and I don't listen to it, right? So you need to come back to it periodically with fresh ears, or at least I do. Uh, and so that helps as you move from section to section, it's sort of like getting a new set of fresh ears because you're listening to different musical content. Um, and you don't, you know, again, hyperfix. Four bar loops. Oh, it's the, that I did that for so long. It's just the death of me. All right. So that's about it. This is diary number five. Thank you for spending time with me. I hope this was helpful. Feel free to leave comments if you've got questions or suggestions. If you're like, hey, have you tried this? Uh, let me know. I'll try stuff out and we can discuss. Uh, for everybody in the Discord, thank you for all your feedback. Keep it coming. And uh, that's about it. Thank you for your time. You have been watching Sin Seeker. Talk to you later. <laughs>